Hello and welcome along to another end of season review from this FM22 One Club story with Hemel Hempstead Town with me Daniel. We're back for the end of the second season with Hemel Hempstead today and we're going to have a look back at what's been a pretty successful season despite the little claps towards the end. We're also going to have a look at our plans for the summer extensively because I'd imagine they're going to be quite big ones. We're going to look at what work we'll look to do in the summer and again like last year see how successful we can be. And I also want to have a little delve into the medical centre because we've had next to no injuries in this save and almost to the extent where I feel it's unrealistic. So I just want to see if there's anything in particular that's making that happen because it's certainly not world-class staff. It's certainly not world-class facilities. I'm intrigued to see what it might be. We're also going to have a little bit of a look at the data hub again for some of the key stats. Not going to be a big feature today though because I want to save that and things like the mentoring group for the next couple of years. So if you're looking forward to finding out how we've got on this year and what we intend to do to turn our side from an 8th place team into one that's competing in the playoffs this time next year, please do put a thumbs up on the video. Subscribe down below for daily FM22 content from two long-term stories. There's a new video rotating each day at 3.30 as the new schedule starts tomorrow. So after the head coach today, we'll have our transfer special with Hemel tomorrow at half three and then the head coach Wednesday and so on. However, in the meantime... We've got FM22 Mobile. The first video will be live tomorrow morning as soon as I can get it out. So please do make sure you give it a try. Turn that notification bell on. We've still got regular live streams over on Twitch. You can find the link up in the eye above. Next stream's today at 6pm, so come and join us for that. But a massive thank you for your support as always. As we get into our end of season review with Hemel Hempstead. It's 8pm on Sunday at 9. We get our formal season review. So let's start by skipping ahead to that and seeing just how our season was rated. Here we go then, and I think this second season falls in a category of extremely successful, but not a lot to show for it. Although I guess our plan at the start of the season was to avoid relegation, and we missed out on the playoffs on the last day. We cannot complain. The new arrivals, as much as they were largely intended to be backup players, have been brilliant for us. Riley Harbottle was the one first teamer. He's come in to replace Joe Redmond, who left us for Sligo Rovers last year. And he's done a really good job. He's been a solid partner to Quebecqua, albeit not quite so good. And there's been lots of able deputies in the squad too. Matthew Carson has pushed his way into the first team. He's also now a youth international, which is great. Jack Senga, really impressed whenever he played, as did Harry Brook. A few of the more experienced ones didn't play too much, it has to be said. But largely, the summer was really good. The only one that disappointed me a tad, and I've got to be honest, is Oliver Turner. I think it's more a ratings thing in FM. Because he's played in centre midfield in that playmaker role. And he's quite often had a poor rating. Despite the fact we've seen him make key passes. Like the second one before a goal for example. So I'm not sure it's entirely justified. But despite his immense talent. I'm not yet entirely sure whether I'm going to give him a deal for next year. Because his rating was 6.59. Now I know when we get on the ball more. We maybe play a shorter passing game. We become the side I want to in the long term. He probably suits it down to the ground. But at the moment. I'm just struggling to get the best out of him. I have got to consider though, was his first season of football at senior level. So maybe next year we'll see a different player. If he'll sign a contract for about the same money, I think I'll probably incline to keep him at the moment. Because I don't know that we're going to get much better in the window. However, if he wants a pay rise after this season, I think we have to say no. That's the truth of the matter. So the player's in, very good. The player's out. Joe Redmond, he must have played. I played a few last year because they play winter to winter, don't they? He did really well and then isn't playing again now. So we'll keep an eye out because maybe in January next year we'll be able to bring him back. And he's still certainly good enough to be one of our four centre-halves. If we can get him back for free, that would be great. We'll keep an eye on what his wage demands are, though. Stephen Gleeson went to Longford, excellent player, but physically he was already declining, is now even greater. In real life, he'd left Hemel just before the new game came out. He's now at Hitchin Town, even more local to me. So if he stays there for a year, might see him on the channel again in future. Who knows? Uh, Kyla Jai and Castiglione were backup players. They've done all right at lower levels, but nothing to set the world alight and prove that we were wrong for letting them go. So that's the transfers, the season results. Look, we've got to be delighted with this. I know, unfortunately, we lost out on the playoffs because basically we went 10 winless just before the end of the year and only got six points in that spell. Or seven points, sorry. We drew most of them. The issue is that we then drew the last two games of the season in ones we should have won. And if we'd got wins there, we would have been in the playoffs. So we know that we're not far away. We really struggled for goals last year. The league table doesn't lie. 
Our goal difference is not far off the top six sides. We've conceded just as few, but we've not scored enough goals. And I've got to work on improving the attacking line while keeping that defensive solidity at this level and protecting the defence. So I'm hoping maybe better fullbacks will allow us to be a bit more expansive. But I'm not sure how that's going to pan out. It might be a little year of experiment next year. And maybe that's one where it does or doesn't go right. We just don't know yet. But the average attendance was up past 1,500. Sedende still got 15 goals to be fair to him. Despite having a patchy season. In the FA Cup we ran Cheltenham all the way in the first round. Of course didn't benefit from replays due to the Winter World Cup. Otherwise we would have had a payday. The FA Trophy is probably where I'm most disappointed. Because Gates said away it was a collapse. It was an awful performance and I think we had an opportunity to try and retain our trophy there but it doesn't matter. We've won it once and that's all we need. Let's look at the moments to remember. A 4-1 win at Kings Lynn was certainly our we've arrived moment in the National League and it started a really good run up to Christmas there as well. Brown Sterling got a hat trick, didn't offer much after that so probably will be going but another player where look he's done a lot for us but we can't have sentiment at this level. If we have sentiment and keep players because we like them we're probably going to fail. To get to the top and maybe win a top trophy in 20 years, we're probably going to have to be very ruthless. And that means people like Brown Sterling, possibly even Ifianyi after his second half of the year, we just have to say, sorry, but we've got better players in line. The match to remember was a 2-0 win at Maidenhead. We saw that game on camera. It was a really good performance. And that was in the first international break as well, without Oshieng and a couple of others too. And then in the FA Cup, goal of the season was Sam Mantum. And what a goal it proved to be because it got us to extra time and penalties where we eventually won through and then we had that big game against Cheltenham in the first round. I would argue that might have been the match to remember. Certainly would have if we got to a replay anyway. The finances, probably the thing I've been most excited about this year. I don't quite know how we've managed to get less broadcast revenue in a National League than we did in the North or South unless there's a payment to come later on. The competition prize money, again... I may be thinking that's going to come a bit later because we did well in the FA Cup and we finished well in the league. However, the good news is the corporate, the match day revenue, the sponsorship are all up significantly. I mean, the first two, the match day stuff has actually doubled near enough. So we're looking in really good shape there. We haven't improved the club reputation yet. We haven't got any more new sponsors. However, we've got some heroes on the shirts. And maybe that's another reason to keep Turner. He's in the top five there despite his performances. But it's the first year, as I said before, that as a semi-pro club, I can ever remember running at a net profit. And I know it's only a little one, but without a massive FA Cup run, that just doesn't happen normally. Let's see how we lined up. What have they picked? So they've gone for Brook and Muntum in the middle as well. I don't blame them for that. Dobson had a really good start to the year, but he's 32 now, I think. He's just starting to decline a little bit. You can see there the physical stats are going. But if we let him out of the first 11... We need another player who can take set pieces, to be honest. The fullbacks, I don't know. Right back, I feel like we need to improve a tad. Carson is rapidly improving. He got better as the year went on. And the good news is, he's going to be starting every game now. So, it's going to make a big difference on that front. So, then they, not the best rating. Same for Marsh Brown. I think they're the two attacking positions. We might need an upgrade. Let's have a look at the accolades, though. We did win manager of the season last year. And I think we were nominated for manager of the year this year. So it'd be lovely if we could get in the top three, but not to worry if we don't. Cole Capetqua wins player of the season. Absolutely no shock about that. He's been brilliant. Harbottle, young player and signing of the season. Just shows the pressure our defence was under, to be honest. Goal of the season we saw was Mantum. Zedende and Dobson get the score and assist awards. But really, they're not impressive enough numbers if we want to chase the top. And then a shout out for Cole Kopecka again, 13 player of the match awards, one of the best average ratings in the league and his passes completed were fantastic as well. We've got loads of other little awards on the right there including fastest goal for Demalio Brown Sterling and most goals in a match where he got his hat trick. 23 clean sheets from David Gregory, first season after promotion, that is an incredible achievement. We go and have a look at the actual table in the end because our goal rate was fantastic. We only conceded 36, which is the third best in the league, joint third with Carlisle. But goals, 47 scored all year. That is the fourth lowest in the division. We have to address that attacking line and be a little bit more ambitious. I know it's the example I always use, but Sheffield United, that first and second season in the Premier League in real life. First one, won every game by one goal because they had the confidence, they had the momentum, they had the solid defensive line with everyone fit. 
as soon as that went a little bit, they started losing every game by a goal. And that's what I don't want to happen to us next season. And with the games being as tight as they are, it's the sort of team it could happen to. So we've got to improve and make sure we don't do that this year. In terms of the overall best 11, a few players are inducted, but at this stage, it doesn't mean a huge amount. We're going to have a look at our season review, which was excellent. We did go as high as fifth. We were in that playoff mix for a long time, but then that 10 games without a win has really cost us. The expectations for next season are that we avoid relegation. So it's not just enough to fight now, we are expected to stay up, and the next few years we're expected to be an established National League team. Do you know what? I think we can do that. We've got a good core of a squad here, or a good core of a team I should say, we just need to make it a good squad. So let's accept that vision, squad dynamics are good, we've got a couple of big leaders now in Mantum and Dobson, they'll both be staying here next year if I can get Dobson a new contract. And to be fair, the five highly influential players will all be tied down next year too. So that gives us a real base on the dynamics front. And look at the social group. I've completed the dream again. Every single player is in the core social group. I've talked about the reasons for that in a season one review. So you can go back and see that if you want to know how we do it. But that, the official holy grail now, without any late loans in a year. I'm so pleased with that because it does affect performances on the pitch. I think this season has proved it. I can certainly promise you we're not the 8th best team on paper in the league. And considering the next semi-pro team is 15th, it tells you how well we've done. The end of season team meeting, let's tell the lads we're expecting to avoid relegation. We're delighted with that. We're not making any promises. And that's a very good end of season meeting. Hopefully no Winter World Cups next year. No other disastrous competitions. We just get to actually enjoy the football. And that leaves us with this, which is the injury report. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. I know this year we had a few more physical injuries. We didn't have many at all last year. It was about eight. But they're all so small. We've not had any big injuries to one of our first team squad players. And the most we've really had are little three-week knocks. Turner's was when he was coming into the club, so it didn't really make a difference. Watts had one, Carruthers, Ogunteo, and everyone else. It's just odd little few days here and there. It's really weird and the complete opposite to what we normally see in non-league. Now, I know I've put a conscious effort into not getting injury-prone players, but it still seems surprising to me that there haven't been more little impact injuries and also how quick they're recovering from them. So maybe we've got something special in this squad and maybe that's what we'll lose if we try and improve over the next few years. I don't know. And we've got to bear in mind as well, we're playing quite a sort of a cautious line when it comes defensively. We're also playing quite a, a low pressure game when we're on the ball. So it's not like we're flying into tackles and collisions. We're trying to be quite reserved in our approach. And I think that might be helping too. Interestingly, I can note from this screen that Cole Capecra is wanted by EFL clubs again. That would be catastrophic if we lost him this summer. So I might have to try and get him another year on his deal very quickly. But the injury side, considering what we've had with like Derby in the live stream series, I don't really understand how it can be so different. I know there's a few injury prime players in that squad and that's why we're getting big injuries there. But the lack of small injuries is something that I find really strange. And it's the only FM say probably ever that I'm going to complain I've not had enough injuries. So we'll make that a small complaint for now. Let's go back and have a look at the analyst report for the end of the season. Because rather than today showing you something big from the data hub, I want to show you some of the key seasonal statistics we get sent at the end. Because I feel like this is the type of screen that a lot of players will just skip through. But we want to have a little look at it. Because if we've got a decent head of performance, which our one's not the worst to be fair, He's got 9 for analysing data, 10 for tactical knowledge. At this level, he's not going to give me awful advice. And he's not saying these are the areas you've got to do something about. He's just saying these are my key findings. And you can see the first one tackling. It says our tackling numbers look like they're worth investigating. So they're just pointing out that these things are outliers. Because we talked in our data hub special about it being so overwhelming and what ones I use, what ones I prioritise. But this is a great screen for finding what you should look at. Because Matt Page will either suggest outliers or he'll suggest things that he thinks are strengths and weaknesses. And you can look at them and pick up one or two that might be. So I can already see that tackling, if it's worth investigating, let's have a look. We are fewer tackles, but quite poor tackling. So we're always going to have fewer tackles because I always get my side to stay on their feet. I always get them to make interceptions rather than challenges. But it's also a concern to me that their standard of tackles when they are making them now aren't as good. 
Is that because we've got weaker fullbacks who aren't as great in a tackle? Is it because we're not getting our midfield close enough and they're ending up missing challenges or flying in late on? It's still probably about average for the league because there's not that many teams in a good position, but it's something that we've got to be concerned about. And when I improve, say, a right back next summer, I might look to see does that edge up because you'd expect from ratings it's probably not Kopecka and Harbottle, is it? The next two are in relation to long shots. And the first of those is we've scored none of our 24 shots attempted from outside the area. I think these stats are last five matches. It is. So one head up, one with a set piece and 22 with our feet. And what you've got to ask here is why on earth are they all going so wrong? But they're all from very central positions. Are we giving defenders too much time to close down? Are we, are we sort of telegraphing our attacks? Are we not getting to a position where we're shooting from, say, here, just on the edge of the box, on the wide angle? Are we not getting into a position where we've not got players around us? If every shot is under pressure, this is probably the result. So we have to look into how we build up our play and maybe make some tiny minor adjustments. Get one player further into the box to hopefully take a midfield runner with him. Leave an extra bit of space so Mantum's one-on-one -on -one rather than two-on-one. Those little things we can look at. But it's really nice for us to have areas we can focus on without having to go and drill down into the details of the data hubs. In the other side of that, we haven't conceded any of our long-range shots. And I'd imagine, and I'm right, an awful lot of these are either blocked or saved because we want to encourage teams to shoot from distance. We defend in that block, so we've got the edge of the box covered. Kopecqua, we've seen with his interceptions. We've seen with Harbottle getting a good rating. We're okay in that central area. But the one thing that does frustrate me, and the one thing you can see a difference with, is that they're having more shots from wider areas on the edge of the box, our opponents. And that's something that we may have to look at, because we're not having that width. Ours are all condensed within the D. So we've got to approach our build-up slightly differently. And maybe, for us, it's about getting better wide players, so we can try and exploit those positions as well. But wait and see. Our attacking goal output stats really do stand out. Let's have a look. And they stand out poorly. So look at that. Low scoring, impenetrable defence. It's really interesting. We have got, if we look along there, well, the joint fourth best defence in the league, haven't we? However, going forward, there are not many worse attacks. And he's right to say it stands out because we've noticed that all season. And while this is a slightly more obvious one, we know that we have to improve the attack more than the defence this summer. Yes, I've complained on occasion about the fullbacks and not being strong enough in that sense. But we either have to get better defenders so we can push our tactic up a little, or we have to get better attackers, so we can take advantage of the fewer chances we create. Our aerial numbers also stand out. Lots of heading, but poor heading. I mean, that sums up the National League for a lot of sides, as you can see, because let's be honest, virtually two-thirds of the league is in or just around the parameter of that top left corner box. So no surprises there. That is the data analysis we're going to focus on this summer. Because actually, without going into the details of the data hub, that tells us virtually everything we need to know, some of the things we've thought this season, and even one we haven't noticed. But let's go and finish off with a squad, and I'll show you what I'm planning to do this summer. Well, I'm sure there's no real surprises in here, but this is our plan for the summer as it stands. I actually think the core of our defensive side is pretty good, and that's evidenced in our defensive record this year. However... We're going to have to improve the backup team again. And it is a lot of the side from the first season still. But what we've got to do now is try and instead of bringing in sort of replacement backup players, is identify the areas in the team where actually we should be going for a first teamer. There's a few where I'm not so worried because, say, Harry Brook will take over from Mantum next year, who's just passing the 30 mark now. At the back, I'm quite confident. But given the way we defend and the amount of fitness it uses... We're probably going to need to get an extra good centre half in, an extra full back in each position. We're going to need a very good backup holding midfielder, which we didn't have last year. Senga just sort of flitted between the two, but there were some days we needed both and we didn't have him for both positions. Having said that, I'm largely really pleased with the defence. Gregory is a keeper here for the long haul. Carson has been brilliant and is improving. Kopecqua, there's not words to describe him. The problem is... If we get a big offer, we're probably going to be forced to sell him because we're at a level where we can't reject six-figure sums. Thankfully, his value at the moment is only 40 grand and it's not worth it to sell him for that. But if we get him a new deal and then that offer becomes 100 grand in two months, I probably have to take it, to be brutally honest. We want to be realistic in this save. Having said that, the only defensive area I think we need a replacement is right back. I think our starting midfield is fine if I can get Oliver Turner playing. I might even start training him as a number 10. And then maybe go 4-2-3-1 in future. 
But for now, the big area to improve is the front three. If we're being honest, looking at our first 11, it's our weakest area. It's the weakest according to our assistant, and it's the weakest according to me. Next year, if we've had a good summer, Sedende, Dobson and Marsh Brown, heroes of the first season, and did a decent job this year, will all be backups in this squad. Because I think we need to improve the whole front three to match the levels of a Kopequa, of an Oshiang, of a David Gregory. And if we can do that, I think we've got a great chance at the playoffs and getting into the playoffs comfortably too. So that's my plan for the summer. That's what I intend to do with the squad. Let me know if you agree or disagree with my plans. Let's be honest, it's still actually overall going to be a quieter summer than last year because we've already got seven of our first 11 nailed down, apparently. And we've only actually got four subs to look for. For the rest, and particularly the backup positions, we'll try and find ourselves three or four more Harry Brooks, Jack Sengers, players that we can get in from top tier and second tier clubs having been released after their scholarship. So hopefully that approach continues to work, gives us players we can maybe make a profit on later down the line. I've already got my list of trialists prepared from some of the scout reports. I'm just waiting for them to fully scout the players, which should be another couple of weeks. But if you're looking forward to the new season and you did enjoy this episode, please do put a thumbs up on it. Let me know in the comments what you thought of the year, whether my priorities are right for next season, if there's anyone else in that team you'd be replacing to start with. If you haven't already, subscribe down below and turn that notification bell on for daily FM22 content. The voice is going, but we should be back tomorrow with a transfer special from Hemel Hempstead Town at the later time of 3.30. I'm back at my day job now, so we're back to daily videos at half three and we'll rotate between this one and the head coach. There's also, though, tomorrow morning, something special coming from FM Mobile, which releases tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to that. I hope you'll come and join me and give it a try. There's a link to all the playlists and the Twitch channel in the eye above as well as that Data Hub special I mentioned a bit earlier on. But a big thank you for watching. Your continued support as always. It is greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time for a transfer special with Hemel Hempstead as we're going big to try and get into the playoffs. I'll see you there.